Hey, brother! Ben, if anyone has had a depressing story in the world of Harry Potter, it is Credence Barebone. Literally the darkest wizard ever, at the time, is trying to hunt him down to abuse his power. The entire Makuza tried to group murder him. He basically exists as a black cloud of rage. His parents abandoned him, and his adopted mother is the physically abusive literal leader of the Second Salemer anti-magic movement. So, yeah, not a great life so far, but... The upside is, it looks like he's getting a girlfriend in the next movie. The downside is, she's probably going to kill him. Hey, brother! Ben, let's talk about Ravenclaw House for a second. Don't worry, we'll circle back to credit. It's all gonna make sense, you'll see. If you ask me, Ravenclaw really gets the short end of the stick when it comes to the books. And Calm down, calm down, Hufflepuffs. I hear you out there huffing and puffing, shouting, saying, how, how dare you take that away from us? We, we are the duffers in this story. <laughs> and don't you worry, I am definitely not taking that one away from you. I'm just talking about in terms of representation. As far as the books go, Gryffindor are obviously the heroes because Harry's house has to be the best. Slytherins, ridiculously, are considered the bad guys, whatever. Hufflepuffs are the duffers. Let me be clear, I personally don't have any issue with Hufflepuff house. It's just that well, like, Ron literally calls them duffers. Fred and George refer to them as pushovers. Harry himself feels a sense of guilt for potentially outshining Cedric, who's bringing Hufflepuff House the kind of glory it hasn't had in centuries. The point is, despite the fact that I'm sure they're all really great people, that is undoubtedly their reputation at the school during the time of the books. But so where does that leave Ravenclaw? Well, they're the smart ones, and somehow they're actually the only house that seems to be respected by all other three houses, Slytherin included, and I think most people would probably put them on the same level as Gryffindor and Slytherin. But they just aren't. See, because Harry's house has to be the best, and because Slytherin are his main rivals, and Hufflepuffs aren't threatening to anyone, except maybe a stack of pancakes, it means, and it's not super obvious, but if you start looking closely, it means that Ravenclaw somehow actually becomes the punching bag for Slytherin. Ravenclaw is the worthy opponent that the Slytherins get to constantly beat so that they still seem like a threat to the Gryffindors. Like seriously though, there is almost no occasion where any Ravenclaw gets the upper hand on any Slytherin in the entire series. Minus I'm sure a few Luna love good moments. Happy Corpus! This is most evident on the Quidditch pitch, where at least while Harry's there, Ravenclaw never defeats Slytherin. There are some years where we don't know the outcome of that match, but based on how the house championship is going and how important Quidditch games are to the points, it's still heavily suggested that they lost. And in terms of representation, until Luna gets there in book five, they're just like barely even there. Yeah, sure, there is Cho Chang, who after three whole books of anticipation, Harry finally dates for like one whole hour. True, true, they did have Lockhart and Quarrel, and yes, they were great role models. Hardly any of you remember that my favorite color is lilac. Although, be honest, raise your hand, how many of you even realize that both of them are even in Ravenclaw? Because it is not mentioned in the books. But with that said, this issue actually ends up being a much bigger theme than just school rivalries and Quidditch. When it comes to Slytherin versus Ravenclaw, there is a predictable and almost certain winner every time. Book one, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. The big Ravenclaw in this one is the aforementioned Quirinus Quirrell. Interestingly, Quirrell isn't even against the Slytherins. He's very much on the side of Lord Voldemort. Or maybe I should say Lord Voldemort is on the side of him, right? <laughs> he trusts him, he gets close to him, and even though he does everything he says, ends up dead. In Chamber of Secrets, well, Lockhart doesn't end up much better than Quirrell, but he's not actually the Ravenclaw we're gonna focus on. Instead, we're going to focus on the other big Ravenclaw of the story, Moaning Myrtle, who is the only character in over 50 years who manages to actually get killed by the ultimate killing machine, the Basilisk. Seriously, how bad is this Basilisk at its job? Like, you know you can kill stuff with your fangs too, right? Why are you just hitting this reflection and running? You are a 100 foot snake. What are you afraid of? Oh, no, that's right, roosters. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. 2-0, snakes to the ravens. And from there, we're gonna go ahead and skip to the Deathly Hallows, where the pattern continues with the Grey Lady and the Bloody Baron. The Grey Lady is Helena Ravenclaw, daughter of Rowena Ravenclaw, and one of the first students ever at Hogwarts. She is romantically pursued by the Bloody Baron, who I guess at this point is just 
the Baron, who is a Slytherin. At some point, though, she decided to steal her mother's diadem and run away, and then her mother fell ill and sent the Baron to retrieve her, and when she wouldn't come back with him, say it with me, he killed her. 3 -0. Like, what is happening here? Why are the Ravenclaws so bad at not dying when they get too involved with the Slytherin? Well, I think for that answer, we can actually turn to one of Aesop's fables, fittingly titled, The Raven and the Snake. I'm actually gonna read you the entire thing because it turns out fables are super short and this is only like two lines long, so gather round. As a snake lay lazing at his length in the gleam of the sun, a raven took him up and flew away with him. The snake kept a twisting and turning till he bit the raven and made him curse himself for being such a fool as to meddle with a purchase that had cost him his life. And now, a reenactment. Hi, Snake. Hi, Raven. I'm gonna pick you up. Mmm, I prefer you didn't. Too late. I gotcha. I'm gonna bite you now. 4-0. Raven's dead. I agree. It's not a great fable. I mean, what's the lesson supposed to be? Don't pick up snakes? Uh, duh. No, actually, it does go a little deeper than that. To clear some stuff up, because it isn't maybe super obvious, the Raven doesn't actually know what a snake is. He's just thinking, hey, food! And the real lesson is that if you hanker after something you don't understand, then you must be prepared to accept the consequences of those actions, even if that means death. Which brings us back to Credence and his probably gonna kill him girlfriend. And yes, I hear what you're saying. Uh, Jay, Credence grew up in America in a magic-hating house and definitely didn't go to Hogwarts, so how is he gonna end up being a Ravenclaw here? In fact, a few videos ago, you guys even said that he's probably gonna be a Lestrange, so wouldn't that absolutely make him a Slytherin, if anything? Shouldn't he be the one killing her? Not to mention Maledictus, who was in the circus, and we have no way of knowing what school she went to, if she went at all, so how can we put her in a house. Well, even though we've been using Slytherin and Ravenclaw to demonstrate this example throughout the series, this example is actually going to be way more literal. Yes, a few videos ago we did reveal that Credence is in all likelihood a Lestrange, as revealed in this low-light sewer-based family tree. Is it too much to ask for a single well-lit unblemished family tree in Harry Potter? It probably is. If Harry Potter has taught me anything, it is that being the kind of family that cares about your lineage throughout history is being in the wrong kind of family. The other interesting thing about that family tree, though, is the bird under the name Corvus. Like, why include that? And the reason is because it's a hint. A hint that points us directly to the fable we just read, because Corvus means raven. Yes, despite his actual last name, Credence is not the snake in this scenario. He is indeed the raven. In fact, his own actual first name may also be Corvus. It's a little hard to make out, but I'm pretty sure that's what it's going to be. Which would leave Maledictus then as the snake. We've made a few videos about that, but I'll go ahead and recap it for you. Maledictus isn't her actual name. It is a condition she suffers from. It is a blood curse that will ultimately turn her into an animal permanently. Now, we don't know exactly what animal she's going to turn into, but we do kind of know exactly what animal it's going to be. It's a goat. And then Aberforth is going to fall in love with her. <laughs> Just kidding, it's definitely going to be a snake. I have no idea why Aberforth is so into goats. Literally, I've researched it. I can't tell you how badly I want to make that video, but I just cannot find a good reason. Not only is she wearing a fairly scaly snake-like outfit, but there's also these giant posters for the circus, which she's in for the snake lady. So yeah, Credence's real name literally means Raven, and she is literally going to turn into a snake and then literally kill him. And isn't that just so fitting for Credence? I mean, we mentioned earlier how terrible his entire life would be. Doesn't this sound like how it would end? It's the classic story of boy falls in love with cursed snake girl. She says, no, it'll never work. I'm destined to turn into a terrible snake. I won't be myself anymore. And he's like, I don't care about that. Look, we learned to control my terrible curse. I can shoot it out of my hand and everything now. Look. And she's like, dude, I really don't think you understand the situation here. I'm gonna literally turn into a snake and then literally kill you. But we're both so misunderstood. You make a good point. Let's do it. And then she turns into a snake and literally kills him because snakes always beat ravens in Harry Potter. And if that's still not good enough for you, look who is responsible for the modern translation of that fable that I read to you earlier. One Robert L. Estrange. Yeah. This is happening. And actually, this fits in super well with the whole Maledictus will be Nagini herself theory in a very Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sort of way. Like, she, the human, is very nice, but the snake is almost a whole different being altogether. It's a great way to make us, the audience, feel really sympathetic towards her and Credence and also feel okay hating the snake because, well, 
we already do. Now, whether this happens in the very next movie or a little bit further down the line, up for debate, but I'm pretty sure it's definitely gonna happen. But Ben, there you go. My question for you and everyone else is, what do you think? Will Maledictus kill Credence? Let me know your thoughts in the towel section down below. And also real quick, I wanna give a shout out to the podcast, Fantastic Geeks and Where to Find Them, hosted by Brizzy Voices and Tessa Netting, who first pointed us in the direction of this fable. Thanks guys, I will leave a link to their podcast in the description down below. But speaking of podcasts, Ben and I have a very fun contest we want to announce. Last month, you may have seen the world's worst Disney vs. Pixar bracket floating around the internet, and we were flooded with endless requests to fill it out ourselves, but we figured, hmm, why stop there? Why not fix it and expand it into the ultimate Super Carlin Brothers fandom bracket? Over the past few weeks, we have been working closely with our younger brother Tyler and his movie review podcast, Bacon and Eggs, to come up with the best 64 movies, Star Wars, Marvel, Harry Potter, Disney, and Pixar bracket with appropriate seeds and everything. Here's how it's going to work. The link to the bracket is in the description. Just click it and start voting on your favorite favorite movies until you get to the end. Then this Friday, myself, Ben, Tyler, and Tyler's co-host Ethan will each start posting a daily poll on our Twitter pages. Each of us will represent a different region. I will do Pixar, Ben will do Disney, Tyler will do Marvel, and Ethan will do Star Wars slash Harry Potter. And the winners of each of those polls will determine who moves on in our own master bracket. And at the end of the tournament, whichever of your own personal brackets most closely resembles our master bracket will win a Nintendo Switch. So make sure you go follow all four of our Twitter accounts right now so that you can play along, vote each day, and help your bracket on the way to victory. Good luck, and make sure you take a screenshot of your final matchup and share it to us on Twitter with hashtag SuperCarlinBracket. These socks are amazing! Guys, thanks for watching the video. As always, please remember to leave a like if you haven't already, and subscribe so you don't miss any future Harry Potter action from us. If you want to see how Maledictus is actually going to be Nagini, you can check out this video right here. Or if you want to see how Credence is related to Bellatrix, you can check out this video right here. But Ben, that's all I've got for you today, man. I will see you in another life, brother.